Welcome everyone to this uh, new edition of the Morning Cuppa podcast. I'm joined by Lena today. Um, so hello Lena, how are you doing? Hello, I'm fine, thank you. How are you doing? <laughs> thank you very much for joining us on the pod. Um, uh, for our listeners, we've had about 17 different takes to get this started. Um, we've, we've gone all the way around Lena's house trying to find signal and Wi-Fi and audio. So hopefully this one holds up and it doesn't sound too clipped together. We'll try and do this in one take with t- not too much editing. So um, so yeah, let's just jump straight in. Um, I think we were just talking before I hit record about what you were doing at the moment. Um, so um, do you want to give kind of our audience a bit of background about who you are, where you've come from and how you got into how you got into driving, really? Yeah, um, basically, um, when I was a teenager, I had to go to school in Hungary and um, I choose um, agriculture machinery, which uh, basically give me a, some kind of idea of big machinery, you know, how to drive them and the smell of oil, the smell of diesel. <laughs> So it it, it got nice. into me, it got into me very very early age, but then um, I got busy with the kids and you know starting family. So I didn't uh, pursue my dream. But when um, my kids grew up, I I thought I can uh, you know start. <laughs> so yep. basically, I had a an aha moment basically. <laughs> When I uh, realized that. So what, do... what, what were you doing before you had that aha moment? What was, what was your kind of career trajectory at that point? Um, I was a carer, uh, doing elderly care. Um, I was driving. It's a b- bit of a family. shift, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So what happened to, what was the actual aha moment? Was it just because you were driving between villages and you went, oh, I could get paid to do this bit or, or, or what happened? Um, basically what it happened, I was driving, um, it was summertime, really nice day. I had a convertible, you know, the roof down and then a road diversion came. <clears throat> so I had to leave uh, the main road to a dirt road, basically. And... Um, I was driving on the dirt road, you know, rooftop down. I had music on. I was really enjoying myself because I love driving anyway. And there is a massive lorry came just on this, you know, just across to me, like on the road. I said, oh, my God, you know, how am I going to manage to squeeze through? And then I tried to pull on the side. And then the lorry tried to pull on the side. And then I looked up from my open rooftop to the driver that if we can, you know, uh, pass each other. And it was a beautiful girl driving the lorry, and she had the window nice. down. Did she had you, uh, the music on, and she was like, "I could tell that she's enjoying what she's doing." And I looked up and I said, "Oh my god, I could do this!" <laughs> so, so it was actually seeing another, another, another woman driving that kind of gave you that, "Oh, I could do this moment." Exactly, yeah. And then same day, I went home and applied uh, online for all the, you know, what I needed, the, all the forms and everything my uh, provisional license and that's how it started nice okay that's a, re- that's a really I, I, you don't always get a specific moment when someone decides they're going to do a thing i think that's yeah. most people most most of the people i've spoken to in the last year on the podcast all been like oh but my family did it so it was obvious i was going to go in and do it that was a real kind of specific <laughs> moment when you saw it so how long how long did it take you to, from that moment before you got your license and you were, you're on the road doing doing your dream of driving a hgv yeah, just a couple of years because I was, you know, quite low paid. As you know, carers don't get paid very well. So yeah, and I, I was a single mom, you know, three kids, a dog, and the cat, and the house, and everything. So basically, I could save a yeah. hundred pound a month for for towards my license. I've done my tests, like the theory tests, uh, one by one, because <laughs> that's how yeah. I could afford. And yeah, it took me a few years. You got there, and so what was? <coughs> excuse me. So, obviously, you you kind of got your got your license. Who did you? Who was the first company you drove for? What was your sort of? What was your introduction to the real world of HGV driving? Yeah, I had my license. I think it was July, and my first uh, job came in. I think it was August or something. I signed up with an agency, and they put me on double drive. Uh, to do new lock shops deliveries. Okay. The company called Clipper, and they are quite local to me. It's like 
five minutes drive but it was nice. a really yeah. good song because i was with other guys you know they they tried to guide me <laughs> it was really really hard work how did you how did the other guys find having a, a girl come in like a, a a woman come in to driving with them were they were they supportive or were they a bit like oh what are you doing here uh some of them some of them were happy to you know have me and teach me and just as a company because uh, you spend 20 hours with some you know a stranger in the cab <laughs> you have to kind of make a conversation uh yes. some of them were quite in- ignorant and you know didn't understand why am i why am i want to do this yeah, I think this is, and that, and that was only what four or five years ago. There's there's still an awful lot that has to be done. To I say, the only reason you you well maybe there would have been another aha moment, but your aha moment was seeing another girl doing it, and that was what gave you the confidence to do it. And it's still a very small proportion of 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 women who actually do drive. Um, it is bigger now than it has ever been, but I still think there needs to be more women in it, There's no reason why women can't do it. Um, and as, as obviously you, you prove it's more, you're more than capable of doing it. Gender has nothing to do with it. Um, so I guess, so you started working at Clipper. Was that, was that, you said it was via an agency. How long were you there for? Um, because it was class two driving, you know, the rigid ones. I wanted to work yep. towards uh, doing my class one. Because at that time I had to do class two first and then later on class yep. one first, uh, second. So basically I worked for them three months. And in that three months, actually, I could save up for my class one, which is tells you how much better the pay is doing driving than doing care. Because with care, I, when yes, I was working yeah. for care, it, it took me like years to save up the same amount of money and then in three months i could save up for class one just doing driving yes yeah <laughs> it, it's it's um a lot of people say it's not very well paid a lot of people want more and i mean depending on when we actually air this podcast i mean obviously we've just been through december where there's been dozens of strikes across various industries yes pay is not brilliant but as, as when you put care next to driving they're, they're they're worlds apart in terms of how much you actually get paid so yes no i can i can understand why that was easier um so what did you do after so you did i'm guessing you then did your class one while you were working or did you take time off or what yeah i had a week off because you need five days uh, on the road driving uh, yeah you know the arctic so and i yeah. passed it for first However, I was struggling with class two. I failed, I think, four times because <laughs> of drive <laughs> reversing. But I've done the class one for first. Uh, okay. <laughs> Just uh, three months later. Nice. So in November, I had my class one. Cool. That was, that was a pretty good turnaround time. So what did, did you then move on from Clipper or did you say there were there opportunities for class one work there or did you move on? Uh, well, I told them that I've got my class one now and uh, they can put me on class uh, one work if they want to, but they didn't want to. <laughs> Fair enough. Why, why, why was that? Was it lack of experience or they didn't have any vacancies or what? Uh, I think it was more like they were a bit, you know, I'm not saying scared of me or something, but they didn't trust me probably or I don't know. <laughs> I didn't ask. Did you did you move on from there at that point? Did you go and find work elsewhere then? Um, finally, after Christmas. So basically, I had my license in November. So I spent a full month doing still class two. But they, after Christmas, they offered me class one work, which I was really happy to do. Oh, nice. Yeah, but uh, I made a major mistake so, on the yard. So they, they banned me from the site. <laughs> <laughs> Do, 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 you, do you care to elaborate or do you not want to share that? <laughs> what did you do? What did, what did you do? <laughs> well, I lost it. I lost the trailer <laughs> while on the go. <clears throat> so was that in the yard or? Yeah, I was just pulling off the bay and uh, <clears throat> I didn't put the trailer on properly. So I lost the trailer because um, at that time when you had, okay. um, when you had the test, uh, they didn't teach you anything about basically the equipment of the truck. 
you do forward driving, you say you, you drive safe on the road and that that uh, coupling up the trailer, but only in a set position. Yeah. So when, if the trailer is a bit, little bit down or up, you, you don't know what to do, basically. And my trailer was too high up on the bay. And when I reversed the under, yeah. I, missed, I missed the pin, which I never noticed. Yeah. Because I, was, I had no idea, you know, how to use the suspension. Nobody ever told me and I never, I didn't actually know. <laughs> so I missed the pin. I, I think that's, yeah. I think that's really a, a, that's actually really harsh. I mean, it's obviously very dangerous. Like, it, it, clearly, it, it shouldn't happen. But it, is, it was this all with Clipper at the time. This is all with the same company. So yeah. obviously, you did your class two. You worked with them. They knew you were newly qualified class one. They put you on the class one. Did they give you any sort of support and training on the vehicles? Did they do any kind of? Did, did the transfer manager come out and talk through kind of all these important things or not? Did they just assume you knew it? Yeah, yeah, they, you know, you've got like your license, you should basically do it, you should basically know, but in reality, you don't know. I say, but as you say, in reality, the, the, the license doesn't actually teach you how to like coupling and uncoupling in, in weird and wonderful positions. It's, I, I think that's a really unfortunate, really unfair situation. And obviously it's, it's, it's dangerous. It needs, it needs to be sorted, but I, I would argue that was very much down to the, transport management and compliance team to make sure you were properly trained and inducted onto that because like d did you have any induction on those vehicles or was it just like here you go here the keys off you go sort of thing no basically and i'm pretty sure you've seen a truck before inside there is millions of buttons you know doing all sorts of things like traction control and the suspension and oh my god like so many so many different buttons and when you sit in you don't know it's like you sit in a new car and you try to figure it out what's what you know what what yeah. button if you, if you press something what's gonna happen and on the truck yeah. they're like quite important buttons and you don't know <laughs> yeah yeah i think there's i think that's a, it's a good point for i mean a lot of our audience are operators and compliance managers and directors of small haulage yeah. firms rather than drivers and i think this highlights a really good point that just because someone's got a license especially if they're newly qualified they're probably very very competent at their job but there are things they don't know because <clears throat> a lot of drivers and i'm sure you've come across them they're long in the truth they're old or they're older they're they're male they're yeah. they're quite like stuck in their ways they're like oh i've got 30 years experience if you don't know it i i know how this works and and you need to know i you can't have the experience without having 30 years experience it's like well well teach people then <laughs> help people exactly. um exactly. so i think it's important that that new new drivers are supported so what happened after this happened did you did you get banned on the class one or just completely banned for the yard or or what was the what was the next thing that happened after that? I haven't done any damage, so it wasn't like, um, you know, <clears throat> that bad, but they banned me from the site, so I never could go back for work there. So I started to look for another job. I was had, I had to have faith in myself. <laughs> um, You're not going to make that mistake again, are you? So. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> you don't. So I started to look for another job and applied lots of um, different companies and Stobart was the one who I liked and they responded uh, for my application. They invited me for an interview. They took me out on the road uh, test and then eventually I got employed by Stobart. Was that, so was that was that through an agency or directly with Stobart then? Directly, directly. Yeah. So how was that? Um, on the test drive, um, I was doing very well driving forward, <laughs> but reversing, I couldn't yeah. reverse. It's the same thing, you know, they teach you how to drive and how to reverse on a certain, like an S line back on the bay, bay basically, yeah. to do the test, but it doesn't mean that you know how to reverse. Yeah. So I couldn't reverse basically, but, um. They said that uh, they're going to give me a training, Stobart. So when I started, I had uh, three days going back way on the yard. <laughs> okay, Can you imagine? Just three days driving backwards. Yeah, it's like in an eight, shape of eight, I was driving back way three days on the yard just to learn to drive. 
drive back way and reverse. I, I mean, I, I'm get. I'm. Did <laughs> did it work? Did it help? Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's really efficient. So it was three days that Stobart's had to invest in you to get you there. But obviously, for a lot, as you say, for, for a new newly qualified driver, it's how do you get that experience? You need to, someone has to take a little bit of a punt with you and take a bit of faith and, and actually work on you. And I think Stobart's gets battered a lot in, especially on social media around how they treat their drivers. But that's an example of, of them doing a good job. So what happened off there? Did you, did you then sort of go straight into working with them or, or what happened next? Um, I had three days classroom, um, classroom training as well, but everybody else had to have it. So like taco rules and, you know, everything they covered. Um, and yep. then I had uh, a mentor for two weeks. Kevin and uh, okay. Gaz. Was it another driver then? Yes. Yeah, they were on two yeah. other drivers, Gaz and Kevin. Uh, basically, they came out on the road with me to work from, you know, morning to evening, and they they told me everything I should know. It was a really, really, really good uh, training. So That sounds really good. I, I must say, I've not really spoken to anyone that's worked at Stobart's or is involved with Stobart's. A lot of our, a lot of the people we speak to, I've spoken to, have been small operators, like 10 trucks, so don't quite swim in the same circles. But that sounds like a really positive sort of first month, obviously. Training, yeah. classroom training, mentorship. It kind of gives you, like, some real confidence that you can do your job properly. Yes, they made sure that I'm I'm ready for, you know, doing it on my own. I always felt like somebody is behind my back if I needed help. And, you know, there was always somebody yeah. at the end of the phone if I needed anything to ask. They were patient with me. I, I've made some mistakes again, you know, because you keep doing mistakes and you're... <laughs> so I had to yeah, have I a mean, reason. It's the only way. It's the only way you learn. Yeah. Yeah. So, we, so you say it was, it was Gaz and Kevin. Did, were you still in touch with them beyond your first two weeks? Did they kind of? We did you have them on the end of the phone if you needed them at all, or were they kind of at the end of the induction? They were gone, sort of thing. No, no, they are actually still there. <laughs> nice. So actually, yeah, they are still there. Do you, and... do you still talk to them? Um, I think Kevin followed me on Facebook. I can see his likes on my post. He said he's very proud of uh, me. What what I yeah. Are how far i come <laughs> well exactly i think i think it takes a special sort of someone to be a uh a mentor and they they, they uh, you're very proud of, pe- of 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 their their mentees their trainees so i think yeah that's nice that's nice Psst, I don't know. just a quick interruption to the show quickly i just want to let you guys know of a brand new product that i am super proud that we've launched over the last couple of months The Transport Managers Collective, or TMC for short, is a digital community of TMs to share best practice and ultimately improve safety and compliance on our roads. Not only that, it has been designed to foster close, meaningful connections with other like-minded individuals to help improve your own mental health and reduce that sense of isolation that many TMs face in their professional roles. As I said, I'm super proud of this community. So do go check it out by going to www.tmcollective.co.uk and use the code FREETRIAL to get your first month free. Anyway... That's enough for me. Now back to, well, me. So how long were you at Stobarts for then? Uh, over four years, basically. I just ended oh, my contract okay. with them a few months ago. Like I had a, I'd gone down to zero. Oh, hour. wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I've gone down to zero. I contract with them when I started to be self-employed just to cover my back. You know, if anything happens, I can still go back. Yeah. So wh- when did you, when did you kind of start? dropping down the hours of stow bars and start building up your self-employed sort of portfolio. Oh, that's, a, that's another story. It's about uh, Formula One jobs because uh, I really wanted to do the Formula One jobs. And uh, Stobart got uh, three, <clears throat> three teams to cover, uh, FIA, Mercedes and uh, Williams Racing. Nice. And I wanted to do those... Um, the, those jobs, you know, <laughs> working for them, the yeah. special operations at Stobart, and actually they they got and um, they put me on on one of one year I can't remember was it 2017, but uh, I again I made a mistake and they just you know fired me. <laughs> after, Fair enough. <laughs> after a month, 
with them. So I really wanted to get back on Formula One, but not with them, but with another agent. But I would need to be uh, self-employed to be able to invoice. So I said to my boss that, look, I'm I'm going to leave because I need uh, to be self-employed. And he says, oh, you don't need to leave because um, we can put you on zero hour contract and then you can be a self-employed person as well. Okay. So, so when, when, when did that happen then? Was that recently? Was that? Last, last summer, not this summer, but before summer. I think it was June, okay. July, June, July, when I uh, started to drive so for what, uh, for uh, for the Formula One teams. So what? I mean, I mean, how was that? Was that as exciting as it was? <laughs> as it sounds, or, or was it not as exciting? <laughs> it's like a rat race, you know. You have to you have to push it really hard to get down to to another ra- racing circuit. Um, yeah. So was it was it moving the teams from from like circuit to circuit? Was that was that the job then? Yes, exactly. Yeah, I worked for an agent wow. called uh, Race Race Teams or Race Race Car Inc. Yeah, Race Car Inc. Um, again, we 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 used to be flied out to the circuit, which is finished the race. You know, the Formula One race. Yeah, and pick up the trucks. They were already loaded, strapped up, everything. So we just had a quick check around, and then off we went to the next uh, destination. Uh, it's called back to back driving. So, so literally, it is the vehicles moving twenty four hours? I'm guessing, yeah. well, pretty much. <laughs> any interesting stories from 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 that? Any any kind of touch and go? Anything that you weren't quite going to make it, or was it all pretty plain sailing? Uh, lots of damages, not by me, but, uh, you know, when you have a kind of 20, 40, 50 trucks on the go, uh, d- driven by British drivers who don't really driven in Europe yet, <laughs> you know, yeah. because you have to drive on the other side. And they usually had uh, yeah. left-hand driver, left-hand driver trucks. Or right, it doesn't matter. I really, yeah. Yeah, you jump into a, a completely strange truck, you know, and driving on the other side, and it's a mad rush, so you have to push it really hard. Yeah, yeah. lots of lots of damages, <clears throat> first, second. It, but you got the tension, you know, you got the the good stress. It's it's really nice to work yeah. in a massive team it's- like that, and it's an important movement, and it's nice. Yeah, I guess I guess it's it's quite exhilarating. Like if you don't get it there, they got. I mean, how how far in advance of so um, was it? I'm guessing it was it was Formula One. So the weekend starts. They obviously they start doing practices at the Thursday or the Friday. How long before that practice day do, does the convoy arrive at the circuit? Is it like literally the day before, or are they there a week before, or what's the sort of uh, turnaround time? Yeah. Basically, we had to fly out uh, a day earlier because as we drivers, we have to have a rest day before drive. You know, you can't put yeah. the driver on, yeah. you know, before they were flying and <clears throat> doing the transfers and everything. So we've always been put in a hotel for for rest. And we are arriving to the circuit usually. So the the Monday very early morning, <clears throat> they finish the race. Saturday, Sunday evening, you know, and then they do the rigging, the rigging, uh, loading the trailer, yeah. getting everything ready. So it's it was, it was usually ready by Monday very early morning. Uh, we we cannot drive uh, more than twenty one hours if it's a double drive. That's the legal yeah. limit. So in twenty one hours, usually we reach the next destination. Okay. Basically, I would say Monday, Tuesday morning, we've we've been uh, by the circuit, and we just dropped the trucks, you know, keys hanging up, and we uh, went to the hotel again yeah. for rest, and then flying. And then do you then fly home, or do you then you then fly home? So you literally are flown out to do one long shift, as it were, and then fly home again. Yeah. Yes. Wow, that's that. Yeah, but because it's like. It, we had like 30, 40, 50, once we had 70 drivers and it's not very easy to book yeah. 70 tickets on the airplane. We usually had a day or two no. 
a day or two just <laughs> yeah. spend, you know, in 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 different uh, part of Europe, and it, it's yeah. really fun. And this, you still get paid, you know, doing nothing, just waiting for the transfer home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a, it's. It, it's yeah i guess it's quite good fun like i i i don't do too much traveling for work i obviously i i could talk to people remotely there's there's a very limited amount of time that i've never really had to fly anywhere for a, for a contract or anything so but it, it always looks really um kind of it looks fun i don't think it'd be as fun i think if you did it all the time they would it like if you're in airports the whole time i think it would get a little bit i think i was, I was scrolling through instagram it was like another hotel another another airport another day sort of thing so it's it can get a little bit boring i guess after a while um so are you still doing formula one or is that something that oh, i know it's the end of the season now is the season ended i don't know i don't follow formula one but are you still doing it or is it kind of a you still doing Formula One, or is that kind of ended now? Yeah, uh, this year I was working for Formula One management itself, not for the teams, which is a kind of upgrade. Okay. <laughs> and, Fair enough. And I'm not sure if uh, if they still gonna have the contract next year. If they do, yes, I want I want to do it. Want to do it again. If if not uh, if if I can't do the Formula One management itself, I'm going to do the teams again probably this year. But I would I mean next year. But I I would prefer the Formula One management. They got more time, so, more money. They got nicer hotels. <laughs> you you fly on a private jet, and it's just nice. <laughs> Oh wow! Okay, that that that's next level. That is. So, <laughs> yeah. what, what are you? Uh, what are you? What's the difference? I mean, obviously you're moving stuff from circuit to circuit. Is it different? If it, what are you moving? Is it kind of all the the cameras and like all the like the all the technical uh, stuff, or what? What what is it that's actually moving? Yeah, I hope I'm not gonna get in trouble to say it. It's like broadcasting equipment. I was gonna say, is it mostly that stuff? Obviously, if you're doing stuff for the teams, you're moving. I'm guessing the actual cars, aren't Tandem, you? And, and obviously all the whatever. Yeah, yeah. You're in the entire kind of workshop goes with it, but I guess for working for management, it's as say it's more broadcasting equipment. I think that's pretty obvious. I don't think I don't think you're going to get in trouble for saying that. <laughs> I don't think because when when you're not. doing the, I don't think we're... the job, actually, you're not allowed to put anything on social media. Not the location, not the load, not the trucks, not the reg, nothing. Basically, it's the full ban. <laughs> that makes sense because obviously it's it's there's an awful lot of money in in formula one they don't want i guess people targeting or like security risks and stuff so i can sort of understand that that does make sense so how, how do you do your go looking at your other customers obviously you, you you post a lot on your social media you have your obviously your vlog as well do you do you get permission for your customers to kind of film and show that sort of stuff or do you just do it is there is there sort of rules around that um if uh, if we're editing the videos we try not to put the company name on you know not to publish who's the company i'm doing videos on customer side but i'm not publishing who they are and what's the name and what's the location yeah okay um, I, was, I was watching one you, you i watched one of your your vlogs uh before before today and it was i think it was for green hall you uh you obviously had that that was obviously published and stuff did you get permission from the company or yeah 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 definitely if it's a oh you mean you mean not the customers but the the transport companies <laughs> yeah or or whatever depending on who you're working for i guess yeah yeah if the company name is on i'm, I'm yes i'm always asking if uh what's the media policy of the air so it's always clear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are, are companies generally happy for you to do that, or are they a bit more kind of like, oh, don't don't know? Uh, they usually are. They usually are. They they usually say if it's like a positive uh, approach, then yes, they're more than happy with that. Yeah, I get. I guess, and I guess they do a little bit of research. They watch your channel and find you. And go, yeah, you're 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 a very positive person about this sort of stuff. And I was yeah, I was very impressed with. Uh, it was almost quite calming to watch your videos. <laughs> I was like, ah, this is relaxing to watch. I'm not getting stressed out because you watch some sort of like vlogs on it, and it's like 
to some dude talking into the camera the entire time. And I just like, I get a lot of like nice scenery stuff that you do and like not, not, not a huge amount of you talking about stuff. It's, like, it's quite nice and yeah. relaxing. Yeah. I enjoy that. <laughs> and the other thing nowadays, um, I think video makers trying to dramatize everything, you know, like everything yeah. is like a massive drama because that's draw more attention from people. But I don't really like to do that. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't think it has to be like, especially as, as a, as a woman in transport, you have a certain, I think everyone in transport has a certain responsibility, but I think women especially is as, as we kind of go back to how you initially decided to get into driving was a positive experience with another female driver. You have a responsibility to not make it. You, you want to make the industry positive. You want to make it look like a place you want to work because like there is a driver shortage, there is not enough drivers, and the drivers we do have are getting older and nearing retirement and are wanting to move on. We need to attract the next generation, and you need to make it a positive place to come and work. And every every influencer, every vlogger, every every social media channel, every podcast has got to come across as a <clears throat> this is a place you actually would want to come and work because. As in, uh, you, would you have come and become a HGV driver had you not had that that positive experience with another female driver? Possibly, but I guess that was you. As you said, you literally signed up for your license on the same day as having that happen. It was such a profound, immediate thing that happened that I think it's you have that responsibility. Um, and I guess said so why kind of doing this podcast and stuff. So I guess kind of coming up coming to the end of this now what what's something you wish you'd known if, if you were going to go and do a talk to think people thinking about becoming a driver if you were going to sort of say something to either you when you were you were learning or someone who is learning now what would you what would you say to that person mm -hmm. um the main important thing is just always take the first i mean the, the next step don't try to think ahead too much because that's gonna scare you away <laughs> yeah yeah that can make sense yeah just one step at a time yes i, th I think there's a i i use that with my team occasionally like we, we've got really lofty goals as a company we want to kind of do some fantastic stuff um and everyone sort of sees that as the mountain i'm like that's fine we need to set that goal as where we want to get to you need to have a goal but it all happens step by step <laughs> if you if you would know in advance how much struggle is to to learn everything <clears throat> you would get scared away but just don't think about yeah. that because you can do one step at a time and you're gonna end up learning most of the things but it's like as everybody's saying every day you learn something new in in driving yeah and i, I think as you as you highlighted with your story it's you, you pass your test and then you go into the real world and then you learn how to really do the job. Um, and finding a company, like you said, with Stobarts that is willing to invest in you and support you in training you to, to, to be a competent driver beyond a license, I think is really important. I think it's something that potentially some of the big companies, I'm not, I'm not saying it works in every Stobarts depot in the country. I'm not saying it works in other big, big companies, but I think it's something that we should all, all businesses should strive to is looking to support newly qualified drivers or or inexperienced in that field of work as as you said you were never shown how to line up a pin on a trailer it's like mm, how can you yeah. know that unless you know that so i think that yeah. support is really important so so kind of my, my final question um is where next what you do what what does 2023 bring for you as we're recording this between christmas and new year um what's the what's next steps for for truckalina <laughs> That's a good question. I'm quite impulsive. I don't really like to plan ahead and uh, I don't know. I like, definitely I would like to get more European work. I love driving in Europe and discover more, more of the European side of haulage, which might involve okay. to so, move abroad for a uh, temporarily. I guess you, as we were talking off air, you're saying your, your children are, are more grown up now, so you have less sort of uh, dependence at home. So if you wanted to move abroad, it's, it's easier now. Um, um, yeah, I think that, 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 that's an interesting kind of, are you bored of the UK driving or is it just that the, the, the lure of, of European driving is, is there? Um, yes, I feel like I know everything. Not, that's a really wrong say, thing to say. But yeah, I'm, I'm bored of uh, UK 
football car ready. I need something more exciting. Is that it? <laughs> so I'm ge- I'm guessing if we look to like, is your motivation less around what you're moving and what you're driving? Is it more about exploring the countryside, the the cities? That is is that really what gets you excited? Yes, yes, I love traveling. I love to see different places, you know, different people. It's just, uh, it's really nice. It's a kind of job. I guess. And and action and um, hobby. <laughs> a hobby all rolled, yeah, all rolled into yeah. one. Well, I think, I think we'll, uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up there because I think that's a really nice way, of, like, nice kind of ending of, it's nice to meet someone that, sees this not just as a, as a day job but actually as their as their calling and as their passion so that's fantastic and it's a it's a lovely way to for me to end my 2022 kind of doing this recording with you um so thank you very much lena for coming on um it's been a uh, a whirlwind journey from where you started to where you are and where you're going um uh yeah and um for any of our listeners that want to go and check out some of um, lena's uh, recordings uh she's on LinkedIn, LinkedIn. Are you on LinkedIn? I'm guessing you might be on LinkedIn, but Instagram and, yeah. and YouTube are the two channels that um, I think you're most on. Do you want to say your your Instagram handle? I'm going to get it wrong if I try and say it. I can't tell you. In, in, I don't know. I need to check my, uh, you know, Instagram. Okay, account. okay. Well, we'll we'll, but, we'll, uh, we'll put the link to, in, to your yeah. your your handle in the description so people can find you. Um, and as I say, you've got some really, really lovely videos on YouTube. So we'll, uh, we'll definitely kind of link to your YouTube channel as well. Cause that was a, a very nice relaxing thing to watch. So I, 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 I think it, uh, our audience would find it interesting to, to, to watch your experience as well. So, uh, is there anything else you want to add before we, we, roll, we sign off? Um, just that basically I started uh, my social media on Facebook and I've got 50 K uh, followers on Facebook. If you could uh, mention that as well. Um, i could i can definitely mention your facebook i didn't i didn't know whether it was, uh, instagram as well i've kind of seen a lot of your stuff so i will yeah. i will definitely put in a link to your facebook as well and talk about social media um obviously our channels um instagram facebook linkedin twitter although we're not doing much on twitter now um uh as usual our listeners if you're not already following us and, and engaging with our content please do we do share a lot of useful stuff there we would send, we definitely kind of regram and like stuff from our, our guests as well. So if you want to find, find people like Lena, then please do obviously go and check it out. Other than that, thank you, Lena, for coming on. And, um, I look forward to following your journey over the next 12 months and where you're going. And, and hopefully you can share some of the stuff about your Formula One kind of experiences because that'd be interesting to kind of see what, what that's all about. So, um, other than that, thank you, Lena, for coming. And, um, yeah, um, I'll speak to you guys next week on the morning cuppa. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me, Alan. No worries. Big thank you to Lena for joining me this week, and thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Morning Cup of Podcast. If you like this week's episode, be sure to go ahead and leave us a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. That will help us get in front of even more transport professionals just like you. As always, I do love chatting to other transport professionals. So do go ahead and find me on LinkedIn, Instagram. Um, I'm sure the links will be below somewhere. Um, Yeah, that's all for me. Once again, thanks for listening to the show. I've been Alan, and this has been the Morning Cup of Podcast.